This is Seeking Delphi, episode number 34, The Future School with Frank Spencer. I'm Mark Sackler. The future lives here. While much of the focus of this podcast has been on disruptive technologies and shifting social and political trends, it's important, in fact, I would say critical, that we also focus on how we think about the future. I'm constantly confronted with those who have a misconception of what a futurist is and what types of thinking skills they employ. Back in Seeking Delphi episode number five, I interviewed Peter Bishop, formerly the coordinator of the University of Houston's Graduate Foresight Program and currently the executive director of Teach the Future, an organization which brings futures thinking to the primary school level. Imbuing young people with the long view is an excellent idea. But the here and now is run by adults who often also need a good dose of futures thinking. While schools like the University of Houston and University of Hawaii offer formal academic training and foresight, there's a need for a broader outreach to the individuals who are making decisions for all manner of organizations, public and private. To that end, Kedge, the Futures School, was founded by Frank Spencer. I recently spoke to Frank to find out about the school and how he thinks about the future. I'm speaking with Frank Spencer, the founder and creative director of Kedge, the Future School. Frank, thanks for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's wonderful to be with you today, Mark. Tell us to begin with just a, you know, a little bit about yourself. How do you get to where you are right now as a futurist? Yeah, I have an interesting road because I have been in the field for about 20 years of foresight and futures and innovation and strategy. But uh, my background really is, you know, I didn't before then know anything about foresight and futures at all. It's, it, I sort of stumbled across it in, in the process of being a coach and a, and a trainer and, and helping small to medium businesses and, and entrepreneurs way back in the day. And, and then I found out about this thing about foresight through, uh, people like Jay Gary, who became my mentor at Regent University, where I got my master's degree in foresight. And um, you know, he was the one that really sort of talked me into, hey, this is exactly what you're looking for. This is the field for you. So it didn't take me long to, you know, for the bug to bite me, because I think when people who are in foresight or futures and find it and, and, and get attracted to it, it's, they sort of always say to me, you know, like, oh, this is always what I was doing. You know, this is this is sort of, you know, my mojo, my MO. But um but I didn't know it until I found it, you know, so now I've found my tribe, my home, and I was the same. So, um, you know, I haven't looked back since that day that I, I met Jay and, and uh, started going down the path and eventually got my master's degree in foresight at Regent, and, and uh, here we are. So I actually worked for um, uh, Social Technologies and Andy Hines and those guys in, in Washington, D.C. for a little while. And, and then around 2008, I said, you know what, I could start my own business, which, you know, 2008, we all remember what happened then. So sort of, uh, it was crazy enough that I thought I could start my own company because for those who have done such a thing and try to become entrepreneurs, it's no easy road. Uh, but, you know, also doing it during the, in the midst of a financial crisis, global financial crisis was an interesting time. But it wasn't long before I started finding a few clients and it took a lot of my expertise from days past and, and uh, you know, was able to really uh, parlay that into something that uh, today is, you know, quite successful catch uh, was founded in 2008, as I said, officially. And so we just experienced our 10-year anniversary and have worked with some of the largest Fortune 100s around the world. And actually very proud that, you know, one of the things that we are sort of known for is actually was published in a textbook this past year uh, was building one of the largest, if not the largest foresight competency inside of a corporation and a Fortune 100 in the Walt Disney Company, where we have spent six years building a global features team across 45 countries. Um, people ask us about this case study all the time and and trained over 600 of their executives to be features thinkers. And uh, Bob Iger um, actually said a couple of years ago that they now consider Foresight to be one of their top three leadership competencies in the company. So we're super proud of that work. But of course, we've also been able to work with Hasbro and Lego and Daimler and Ford and you name it. And we this past year worked with the top 40 uh, rhino conservationists in the world to use Foresight to save the rhinos and 
I mean, there's never a dull day around here. So we're super excited about the work that we get to do. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about the future school uh, as well and how that was born, but you could already start to sense, you know, why we went down that path. Well, you um, mentioned a couple of names that are certainly familiar to me, but to enlighten our listeners, of course, Jay Gary is now the chairman of the board of the Association of Professional Futurists. And Andy Hines, of course, coordinates the Graduate Foresight Program at the University of Houston and has sort of been uh, my mentor. So let's get deeper into the future school. How did specifically that come about? What's the mission? Tell us about some of the things you're doing. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk about that because it's one of our great passions today. The Future School, we actually founded in 2015. So as I said, Kedge, the mothership, has been in existence since 2008. And we decided in 2015, after having worked with Disney for several years, we were doing a program inside the Walt Disney Company that we did for other companies as well. As I said, Hasbro and and Daimler Mercedes-Benz. But... um, Really, it was the work that we did inside Disney where we formed a train, the trainer for them. And it ended up being a three-day program that we did in London and Moscow and Singapore and Shanghai and Tokyo and you name it. And so we would go to conferences and we would speak about the work that we had done at Disney and other places. And people would come up to us and say, man, that's fantastic. And I love everything about what you're saying, but I work at a smaller company and I don't have a champion like Disney and we don't have the budget that uh, Disney has. And uh, I would love to know foresight, at least for myself, how do I get my hands on this? So we knew for a while because our mission uh, at Kedge, even before the Future School was launched, was to democratize foresight. And for us, that really means, you know, trying to get future thinking and foresight in the hands of many, as many people as possible, because we really believe that this should be the operating system for everyone. We're not saying that there's not other things to connect to it and, or that foresight's the magic bullet, you know, throughout all of history or anything. But we really do believe that, you know, as time has gone on, we're, we're supposed to be moving humanity away from this past looking perspective to more of a futures looking perspective where we would have seen things like climate change coming and maybe <laughs> taking care of them, you know, long in advance. So democratizing foresight is, you know, a great passion of ours. And so we would hear those people at the conferences and we would say, look, we've, we've got to get away for these people to be able to get their hands on foresight as well. And that's when we launched the future school in 2015. We did the first one here in Orlando. We had a great group. Uh, we didn't know how it was going to turn out. And we took that program that we were doing inside of all of these companies and for nonprofits as well. And we translate it into a three-day course that's hands-on, immersive, um, takes some of the traditional tools and foresight, although, of course, like others, we've hacked those tools over the years, but also takes, uh, you know, tools that are uh, you know, specific to CADGE and, and to the future school that we build, because here we're builders, we're always customizing everything, and, and so uh, unique tools for uh, scenario development and unique tools for pattern and sense making and, and put that all in a bundle of what we call natural foresight, uh, which is a framework that we built, you know, years ago, seven, eight years ago. It's being used by companies all around the world. Of course, Disney uses natural foresight, but Mozilla uses it as their foresight operating system and Daimler does. And, you know, all these companies pulled uh, the force of Auckland in uh, New Zealand, um, which is really foresight focused, um, uses it as their foresight operating system. And so it's something that is spread and that we've, uh, you know, popularized. And this is sort of the basis of the future school. And um, when that first one was really popular and people came to it and said, oh, my gosh, this, I love everything about this. It's immersive. It's, it's hands on. It's interactive. I feel like I can go, go back on Monday morning and start implementing this immediately in my job. Uh, then we started seeing other people come that were social entrepreneurs and social innovators and and uh, designers and, and uh, people that really wanted to move the needle socially as well. And uh, so we ended up, as we were doing the future school, started curating this amazing cohort of people every time that we would do it, that you know, the room had, you know, CEOs in it, but also students and, and uh, you know, executives, but also uh, uh, musicians and dancers and artists. Uh, so that's probably the, the, the magic, you know, that really happens at the future school more than anything else is this great cohort of people who come who are all seeking to move the needle on making a better future. And, uh, but they find out that there's a tribe and they thought maybe, you know, they felt very alone. I'm the only one that thinks this way, but then they find out there's plenty of others that want to see this happen as well. And so we started doing the future school twice a year in the U.S., started getting requests to do it outside the United States. 
And now we've done it in 23 countries around the world. We still do it twice a year in the US. Um, we're getting to where we're probably gonna have to do it more than that now. We always do it once on the East Coast, once on the West Coast. And our next one's coming up in Portland, Oregon, October 21st through the 23rd. And then next year in April, we'll do it in New York City. Um, that's our first time there. So as I said, the magic of the Future School has just been quite amazing. It's growing leaps and bounds. And the people that come to the Future School come from all walks of life and all kinds of different companies. And we're so, so happy to see uh, this platform really be the platform that not only do we see more you know, client work come from it, but we really feel like we're moving the needle more on those people who wouldn't have gotten the Futures in their life to, to be able to get access to it. In terms of how you're going about this, I'm curious to know how it might differ, say, from what a, a program at the University of Houston or University of Hawaii is doing. For example, at Houston, they just call it foresight. You call it strategic foresight. Is there a, a difference? Is that just nomenclature? Is your approach pretty much the same? Or uh, I'm sure you have your own nuances. We do have our own nuances and we have people that go to, you know, those programs that come to ours or go to ours and then go to those programs. Um, and they'll always say to us, you know, that they felt that there was a difference uh, in, in the programs. So, of course, we're good friends with, you know, Andy Hines and Dr. Bishop, who, you know, originally started the master's degree program at the University of Houston, which I know that you know him very well as, as well. And and we're good friends with, you know, Jim Daters. And I thought we'll be on the stage with him in a couple of days in, in D.C. speaking at the Federal Foresight Community of Interest, where we're one of the speakers there. Um, but, you know, and so in that sense, we work hand in hand with those guys and, 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 uh, and we know what they're doing and they know what we're doing. And sometimes we send students to each other's programs. But uh, one of the things that I think is a little bit different about what we do at the Future School is that we're really, really trying to get people to go back on Monday morning and to be able to implement this uh, framework, natural foresight framework, um, you know, in what they do immediately. Not saying that they, you know, you can't leave the Houston program or Hawaii and also feel like you've got a lot of value to go back on Monday morning and, and start your journey. But we find a lot of people come to us and say, I really felt that this program was very, very um, hands-on and, and uh, practical and tactical and actionable. And that's what we want to do is get people to feel like they can go back. We have a motto, and that is that we want to teach people how to fish, which early on in in our, our business, you know, people would say to us, well, it's not a great business model. You're, you know, teaching people how to do foresight and then cutting them loose. But as you probably know, we found that that actually endears people to what we're doing more. And we want them to be empowered. We found that futures needs to be a competency. It needs to be a culture change. It needs to be an operating system, not an app. So we know that, you know, this has to be something that you feel like you can take back and you can implement and you can own or it's not going to stick. It can't be something that a consultant comes in and just does for you and walks away and you feel like you need the consultant come back again, like some of the big four. It's just not going to work that way. This has to be something that is at the core or running the background of the things that you know, you're doing. And so that's one of the things that we pride ourselves on the future school. And we have people walk away saying that this was super tact tactical and actionable. But also one of the things that we're really proud about, too, is that this we've been working on for about two and a half years internally, but we're just launching now. And you've probably seen, you know, recently in, on LinkedIn and around social media in different places is that we have just recently launched a professional certification, not a certificate, which we were giving out before for years and years, um, but a real professional certification that we built, spent the last two and a half to three years building a body of competency and knowledge internally. And even more so than that, besides the assessments and the levels of certification and all the rigor that goes behind that. Uh, we're super proud to have recently launched what we call the Global Foresight Advisory Council, the GFAC. And it's made up of individuals from around the world, it's global, um, with people that we've worked with before that have gone through the Future School or alumni of Kedge, um, who have a real passion to democratize foresight like we do. And so they're doing this within companies and within governments and within uh, innovation entities. Uh, for instance, on the Global Foresight Advisory Council is someone like Xenia Tata, who is the Chief Impact Officer at XPRIZE. I think you and I were talking one time before, and you had recently been at XPRIZE. And so we're a foresight provider to XPRIZE, and we have been for a while. And uh, Xenia is a good friend of ours, and 
she and you know she has worked with us hand in hand in New Zealand and different places and so we know each other very well and she's an alumni of you know Kedj and the Future School and so she's one of the people that's on the Global uh, Foresight Advisory Council backing this certification. So there's uh, at this time I think 13 other individuals who are presidents of uh, economic um, uh, councils and places like New York and and different places and uh, uh, leaders in the field of artificial intelligence from places like Germany and Israel and um, places, uh, people that are working in strategy for places like Dubai, et cetera, et cetera, that are on that GFAC. And they're the ones who are actually um, moderating, you know, how this certification looks, uh, what the assessments look like, um, what the certification, the rigor of the body of compass knowledge it looks like, and they're the ones who are at arm length from us who are actually certifying these individuals around the world. So we soft launched this certification this past year, and now the hard launch is coming up this fall, and we've already got people that are uh, signing up to sit for the assessment, the first level of assessment. There's three different levels, but, and uh, so that's one of the things that is uh, different as well, is that, you know, at Houston, they're doing a great job of not only teaching people, you know, how to take this back into government and nonprofit entities, but as a funnel for the master's degree program, which is fantastic, and we believe in that. Um, but we're helping people to, you know, take this immediately and and hit the ground running with it, and and have that confidence, you know, through certification that they can do this and and be influencers and and train the trainer and and really move the uh, the, the needle in their field. Yeah, and by the way, I did meet Zini out at the X Prize Longevity Impact Roadmap, which was run like a classic foresight workshop. So I have a feeling she probably had some in <laughs> input into that. It was really quite well organized and well done. So let's move on to some of the the issues that you come across when you're dealing with, say, people who may be more neophytes. And I have a talk that I give occasionally to local civic organizations about the sins of bad foresight and in, in kind of initiating the uninitiative, initiated, it, sometimes it's easier to describe something by what it isn't than by what it is. And I'm curious if there are any recurring misimpressions or, that, that people get or, or mistakes that you see them initially making when they, when they think about the, the future, uh, when they come into you kind of as a tabula rasa. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, uh, you saying that, I know that you and I can have a conversation about this that would last probably for days. And um, it's definitely a different way of thinking for them. Um, people are so used to thinking in this linear and industrial model that's, you know, Taylorism, Fred Taylorism, I, I always say to people. And, uh, you know, his model um, at the turn of the century, Industrial Revolution sort of won out um, over other models, you know, that might have been more qualitative, not to say that the quantitative is not necessary, but we get so linear and mechanistic in our way of thinking in short term. And, and so that's one of the mistakes that people make right away is not only, of course, you know, the classic, oh, you've got a crystal ball and you're going to predict the future, you know, thing which I'm sure is on every other podcast that you run that somebody mentions that. But, you know, also just the idea that this is similar to forecasting or that it is forecasting or um, they'll say, oh, we already do that because we do competitive intelligence or business intelligence or consumer insights. And, and you know, we let them know, of course, those things are, uh, you know, they have their place and, and they're good, but they really look at the world from the inside out. And what I mean by that is um, they, they use the filter of their of their organization or their industry perspective to look outward at those externalities and those disruptions or, or better than that, those transformative possibilities as opportunities that are on the horizon or outside their industry and that they end up uh, interpreting and defining the world through that lens, that insight out lens, instead of doing what foresight really is powerful at doing, and that is looking at what they do or looking at where they are from the outside in instead of the inside out. And that means that, you know, today's disruptors and transformations and opportunities more than likely aren't going to come from inside their industry or inside their organization or inside their circles. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, what we do at, at a conference is, um, I love to, you know, when I'm on the stage, I'm, I'm one of those people that the cameraman hates because I move around and I use the whole space and I'm a, you know, hands person. And, and so I love to do this little skit where I'm looking through what I call the keyhole of the present into the room of the future. 
And uh, I'll sort of bend down and act like I'm looking through a keyhole uh, to the audience and they get a kick out of that, but it really sticks with them that we tend to look at the future from through this keyhole as if I'm looking into this room through a keyhole. And when I do that, you know that I can only see a limited amount in the room um, because I'm looking through the perspective of today's assumptions and biases and uh, the linear perspective and the me mechanistic perspective, the short-term perspective that we have. And so it makes me miss a lot of what really is, you know, on the outside. If I'm in the field of HR, I need to be looking at neuroscience. And then I've in if I'm in medicine, I ought to be exploring what the designers are doing. Uh, because we live in a much more, uh, a world's much more complex and really needs transdisciplinary to solve our big world problems. Um, we're not going to find it in these silos. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that we see that people make right away is they start wanting to interpret the future through their lens. And you have to get them right away thinking about their assumptions and biases. As a matter of fact, we like to call this uh, unconscious futures modeling as opposed to unconscious bias modeling. Because of, uh, it's really hard to get a group to look at the future um, when they're stuck in today's biases and they're locked into their short-term thinking. But if I can pick them up and get them to suspend uh, disbelief and transport them to the future, then they can work from a space where they're together and they break those assumptions and biases and look back you know, on, on the past and the future and say, oh, let me walk around in the space and sort of do ethnography and look at the way people are dressing and eating and transportation and living and crossing my fingers that there's trees and rivers in the future. Um, and then I can, you know, break through those assumptions and biases. And so um, that's one of the biggest things that we get them to do. It's the first thing we actually even do at the future school or with our clients at Kedge is whether they want us to or not, we might have to sneak it in on them, is to get them to really think about their assumptions and biases, their present day assumptions and biases. Because before anybody goes to start building the future, they need to think about those assumptions and biases, both individually and as a group. If they don't, they're going to build the same future that's already on their minds right now. And you know as well as I do, the way we see the future directly impacts the actions we take today. Um, and if I have an official future or linear future in my mind, I'm gonna build the future just like is already in my subconscious. So we've gotta get people to break through this assumptions and biases. And for us, that's the first, first thing. Well, you pretty much hit two of my three main deadly sins of uh, bad foresight there, they're related is the linear thinking, but also the foresight blinders, not not seeing what's off to the side. Uh, and you need to see what's off to the side to uh, prevent the linear thinking. So let's move on here. I, I see, and you've talked about businesses you've worked with. I'm just curious to know uh, if you've worked at all with uh, other types of organizations in the futures school, a la uh, NGOs, education, uh, particularly government, where we know there's a <laughs> decided lack of foresight on all levels. Yeah, the news has been very interesting lately, and it seems like that we, you know, if you just read the uh, popular news, we're, we're regressing away from a foresight mindset somewhat, but um, I guess if we want to turn the tables and or flip the tables, then uh, we can certainly say it's a good time for us to to be foresight professionals because we need to really um, herald this message more than ever before. So we have gotten a chance to work across all kinds of industries. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we're doing a large piece of work that we've been doing for about two years now in Dubai, um, where not only are we working with parts of the government that's directly related to our client, but we're working with the largest public uh, university in Dubai. We have been for a couple of years now, where we've trained all of their um, staff in terms of uh, strategy and a lot of their uh, innovation staff in foresight and are certifying them through a professional certification as well. Um, but really cool is that they're taking that back into the university um, we're through the foresight work. They've actually decided now that um, they're no longer graduating students. This is very interesting. But now they need to graduate businesses. So they have, uh, through their recent foresight work, decided that over the next couple of years, they have to graduate, I think in the next 24 months, they have to graduate 50 businesses. So they've created these economic free zones for the universities. Uh, where students now can't, you know, don't have to be taxed and they can use the university system and the resources and the technology there at the university in Dubai to build these businesses, these entrepreneurial businesses for the country. So that was super exciting. And by the end of this year, 
they're going to certify um, uh, their first group of students are eventually going to certify over the next uh, year all 20,000 students at the university in a low level um, certification of foresight to get them first started. And um, this is, as you know, uh, in Dubai has become a big deal uh, through the mandate of the prime minister there that everybody with the title of strategy or innovation needs to know foresight now. So they want all their students to be able to be um, versed in foresight, at least at a beginner's level, and then they can continue the journey if it's something that they're passionate about, because this is a mandate for them. So we got to work with them and some universities in the United States as well. As a matter of fact, I mentioned earlier that we've seen designers flocking uh, to the future school like crazy in the past couple of years. And we're seeing them come from uh, you know, schools like uh, California College of Art and Design and um, from Columbus College of Art and Design and um, Savannah College of Art and Design and then design, uh, well, I should say also Parsons in New York City, where we just um, did a workshop for Primer 19, the, the, the Speculative Design Conference. And I'll be speaking um, at the International Design Conference coming up in Chicago next month. And um, we're starting to see more and more designers come from the big design consultancies and they're coming to the school because they have realized how important foresight uh, is to design and design work because design, as you well know, is not just um, you know uh, building uh, you know picture you know, painting pictures anymore or building websites and that thing people think of when they think of design design is now about strategy and organizational development as well so they're realizing how important foresight is to the design field and so we've been really pleased to see that and it's something that we're passionate about as well I'm really reaching out to uh, you know, that community as well as you know education and and government, as we mentioned earlier, and actually we'll be speaking, I think I just said a, a few minutes ago, to um, the, a group in the government, you know, uh, next week in D.C. So we've got to do some government work as well, as well as with, you know, government funders like Kellogg and Ford Foundation. And, and every one of those clients is very different and they approach it differently. And but it's very interesting to see, you know, how people are are realizing the importance of foresight to them today. Yeah, well, I'm certainly familiar with the future orientation of Dubai. I actually worked uh, a work study program with Andy Hines when I was doing the Houston program that was uh, for the Emirate of Dubai, and it seems um, a little a little odd, but but maybe not that the, probably the two most forward-looking principalities in the world are, are Dubai and Singapore, basically city states. Maybe it's easy to be. Uh, more integrated when you're less homogenous. I don't know, but um, do you have any ideas on how we might get that foresight uh, bent more into Western governments? Yeah, I, you know, it's tough, right? No, nobody's saying that it's not a hard uh, road to hoe because um, I think some of those, you know, things that you mentioned, of course, you know, these uh, uh, places that aren't, you know, don't, they're not, operating off democracy, I use that word sort of lightly, but um, the way that, you know, the Western world has uh, done. And, and that's interesting because those are the ones that we see lagging behind in foresight. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about leapfrogging. We're seeing that in places, um, you know, like some of the African um, clients that we work with as well, or even, you know, um, smaller communities where they sort of feel like it's easier for them to leapfrog. And in the United States where we're very, um, quant centric and short term perspective is dominated and we've got those systems in place it's 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 harder for them to sort of say you know this is going to be a foundational thing for us we're starting with this so to speak um, certainly it doesn't mean that it can't happen and i think one of the things that we've been excited about is that grassroots at least we're seeing a lot of people say and again it's the reason we started the future school i realize that there's got to be a better way and that the systems that i'm using within my job or uh, what I'm doing, you know, even I know that you've done some work with the government as well. And, and there's people at the grassroots level within their jobs are saying, I know this doesn't work. This is broken. And so how do we at least do this from the bottom up? We, of course, would love for it to be a top-down thing, I think, because we know there we have champions and it's something that's mandated and it sure seems like it makes everybody's job a lot easier. But we're certainly seeing, I think, in Western, you know, uh, uh, perspectives, something that's more grassroots, and I think that's the way that we sort of have to perspective, uh, uh, 
sort of have to approach it here. That's the perspective we need to approach it from is that this is going to be a grassroots effort and people saying a, a, a swell, so to speak, of people saying, yes, this is just absolutely not working for me. There's got to be a better way to do things. And so that's sort of the perspective that we've taken is how many people can we reach? There's got to be a better way. Okay. Well, before we wrap this up, Frank, why don't you let our listeners know how they can find you if they want to get involved with any of your programs? Oh, certainly. You know, we would love for the listeners to to reach out to us and the exciting work that we see going on. And uh, they can reach us at the mothership uh, online at kedgefutures.com. That's K-E-D-G-E futures with an S dot com. You can also find us at the futures school. And again, futures with an S. So there's two S's right in the middle together, thefutureschool.com. And there you'll find all the information about the future school, how to register, how to apply, um, how uh, they, can, they can find, you know, what we call the Kedge, uh, uh, Kedge Forward Fund, you know, um, uh, so that they can apply to the school and all about um, professional certification as well. And then you can find um, I and or Yvette Montero Silvatico, my business partner online. Um, you can find us on Facebook and you can find us on LinkedIn and you can find us on Instagram and on Twitter. We're all over the place. Um, so we're pretty easy to, to look up and find. Well, I'm glad we found you today for this inter interview, Frank. I thank you for your time and uh, wish you the best of luck uh, in all the endeavors going forward. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure to speak to you. And I look forward to uh, uh, hearing more from you and more from the podcast. A formal academic approach to foresight may not be for everybody, but we all need a clearer outlook on the future. The Future School can provide that to anyone in any organizational setting, large or small. Links to the school are available from the webpage for this podcast at www.seekingdelphi.com. Be sure to keep listening as upcoming episodes deal with the future of healthcare, space and space commerce, and science fiction as the mythology of the future. You can subscribe to Seeking Delphi on Apple Podcasts, Player FM, and other platforms linked on our web pages. And slideshows for each program are available on YouTube. My technical assistant is Mohammed Maruf. Until next time, I'm Mark Sackler.